Good morning, everyone. This is Jacqueline Sarandria, the Conference and Meeting Manager for SMTA. Um, I'd first like to begin by thanking all of you for attending this SMTA webinar today. And it's actually our first um, joint partner webinar with PCEA. So we're excited to have you all here. Um, just a forewarning, this webinar may go over the 60 minutes that we've scheduled it out to, to be. Um, so if you're in a time crunch and you have to hop off, please feel free to, but um, the gentlemen are willing to stay on for questions. Uh, today's featured speakers are Stephen Chavez and Mike Creedon, and they'll be presenting Creating the Best Data Package for PCB Fabrication. I'd like to start off by giving a little introduction. and. As a senior level printed circuit, circuit engineer with 29 years of experience, Stephen Chavez has sent, spent the past 10 years as a staff engineer and technical lead of PCB design for the Electronic Systems Center Division of Collins Aerospace. He is an acknowledged and recognized subject matter expert in PCB design globally within the industry and within Collins Aerospace. He is the chairman of PCEA, an IPC certified master instructor trainer, and an IPC certified advanced PCB designer for PCB design. He has a very strong and extensive background regarding PCB design with the diverse fields of commercial, aerospace, military, space, and medical electronic industries. He has principal level industry experience, which covers a full spectrum of PCB design, fabrication, and assembly. He is a veteran of the United States Marine Corps, where he has served five years as an avionics te technician and holds an AS degree in mathematics. As for Mike Creedon, he has over 43 years of experience industry experience as an educator, PCB designer, applications engineer, and business owner. At Inselectro, he is the technical director of design education, which helping OEMs and fabricators to achieve design success for best material utilization. He's ex on the executive board and vice chairman of PCEA. He's a master instructor for CID IPC and design certification program, and the primary con contributor for the CID curriculum. He's currently teaching IPC slash CID curriculum with EPTAC, and he's the founder of San Diego PCB Designs. Before we start, uh, please consider the following copyright statement. Applicable copyright laws protect all presentation materials. Any unauthorized use, duplication, or distribution is strictly prohibited. As for questions during this webinar, please feel free to submit your questions at any time uh, via the, web, the webinar interface, and uh, we will be addressing them at the end of the presentation. And before we begin, I do want to note that uh, these gentlemen will be hosting another uh, PCEA SMTA webinar, and actually Mike will be presenting that one on Thursday, August 20th, and both Stephen and Mike will be presenting at SMTA International this year. So I highly encourage you both to register for both of those events and to hear more from them. And with that, I will turn the presentation over to you, gentlemen. Thank you so much for being here with us today. And please feel free to begin. Okay. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks. Uh, welcome, everyone. I want to first uh, take a moment and thank SMTA for allowing us this great opportunity to uh, provide this presentation uh, to you all. And um, for this great opportunity in partnering up with uh, uh, PCEA. So, uh, uh, we'll get started. As I said, my name is Stephen Chavez. Uh, I'm a staff engineer with Collins Aerospace. I'm the chairman uh, of the new Printed Circuit Engineering Association, which I'm really excited uh, about and uh, have our grand opening coming up on August, uh, I mean, on July 14th, which is next Tuesday. And uh, so stay tuned. Uh, uh, as you said, I'm a master instructor for EPTAC. We're teaching the IPC CAD, CAD Plus course for uh, Printed Circuit uh, Design. And uh, that's it. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, PCA, what is that? PCA is the Printed Circuit Engineering Association. It's a new uh, industry association for printed circuit engineering. Uh, the association is an international network of engineers, designers, uh, fabrication, assembly, and anyone related to the printed circuit development. Its mission is to promote uh, printed circuit engineering as a profession and to encourage, facilitate, and promote uh, the exchange of information and the integration of new design concepts, the communication, seminars, workshops, and professional certifications uh, throughout uh, the local area and the region, the regions and our affiliated chapters. Uh, we have uh, several uh, members already. I think we've got uh, over a thousand members in our new association, and uh, we've got uh, several chapters 
that uh, have transitioned over uh, from uh, the existing, uh, their existing uh, being, and now uh, we've got five new chapters already uh, in the works. We've got a, a New England chapter that's uh, coming about. We got Columbus, Ohio. We got a chapter in Albuquerque, New Mexico that's uh, off the ground, and we have Northern Illinois, Southern uh, Wisconsin. So we've got a lot of good activity going on, and we're hoping uh, that what you'll see today with uh, the presentation that uh, Mike will give. Uh, it's just a, a little golden nugget of what PCA offers uh, to the industry, and we hope that uh, you'll visit our website at pce-a.org, uh, uh, and that uh, uh, you'll uh, uh, you'll join our association as well. It's free to join. Uh, there's a lot of good uh, uh, industry knowledge that uh, we're bringing to the table, and what you'll see here, like I said today, is just a gold a piece of golden nugget that uh, what PCA offers of regarding education, collaboration, and inspiration uh, 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 into the industry. And, and what you're seeing here is an example of our, of our new website uh, that we've created. Uh, and uh, on July 14th, as I mentioned, we're having our grand opening where we'll have Rick Hartley come out and, and do uh, a presentation. I say come out, now we're virtual. So uh, we'll do a presentation. So we'll help you, uh, we'll join, it's free to join. Uh, visit our website. Again, it's pce-a.org and uh, come out and have a look. And uh, we're really excited and we'll hope you're, you're willing to join part of the collective and uh, and move uh, as we evolve into the future. So with that said, uh, I don't think, I think the next slide is uh, for Mike. But Mike, you go ahead and hit slide. Our slide, yep. At this point, I'll turn it over to Mike and take it from there again. Thanks again and uh, enjoy this awesome presentation on uh, best data packages. Mike? Thank you very much, Steph. Good morning, uh, good afternoon, depending where you're at. I think most of you guys are still in the morning session. So um, <clears throat> I'd like to welcome everyone here. And um, I'd like to say thank you to Jacqueline and SMTA. Um, I have been attending SMTA uh, local uh, chapter meetings here in San Diego uh, for decades. <clears throat> As you can see, I truly have a lot of years of experience, so I will spare you all just dinosaur stories. Um, uh, thank you for covering my background. The one thing I will say there is uh, printed circuit design engineering um, has truly been my career, and I'm very grateful for it. Um, I love it. I have a passion for it, and I try to convey that passion as I speak and share um, um, at this point in my career. So again, it's a lot of gratitude I'm attempting to convey right now. So with that, let's kind of jump right in. And today's um, topic, I, I had the opportunity to observe who was attending. And uh, I noticed there's a nice diverse crowd here today. <clears throat> Folks from uh, students to engineering to fabricators, supply chain, assemblers, uh, design engineers, design engineering managers. Uh, so. I love the diversity of it. Um, please feel free to, if you want to submit a question during the chat, um, <clears throat> Jacqueline will forward that to me. If I can address it uh, while in slide, I will. Um, if I need the uh, ability to just move on, um, Steph calls that Elmo. Everybody, let's move <laughs> on. <laughs> and um, so today's um, topic, a good data package. So creating the final deliverables. So if you're in the supply chain, all of a sudden you're handed these final deliverables. So the emphasis, <clears throat> what I'm gonna tell you what I'm gonna tell you about is about getting good data. That's where the emphasis is. Because when I package, it can be as easy as pushing a button. The output deliverables can be generated. Nowadays there are macros, each CAD software, um, uh, I, I own the four major ones, um, Expedition, Pads, uh, Cadence Allegro, and Altium. I own them all, and so it's actually pretty easy on Altium to push that button. And that just means you have deliverables. It doesn't mean that it's good. So we're going to talk about what makes for good data. Um, if you just think it's an easy button, uh, that's dangerous. So we'll try to help <laughs> avoid danger. So... Uh, <coughs> So good data. In the cycle of things, how do you capture the input data? 
Okay, that affects how your output data will look. <clears throat> so in any company, whether it's a big company, you know, the Fortune 100, big uh, aerospace or DOD, where it's a large corporation, all the way down to a small startup or the mid-levels, um, it's imperative that you have a team approach, even if that's a team of two. Uh, maybe it's a team of one, you are you're, you're the lone ranger. <laughs> Either way, the team approach for collaboration and communication, this way all expectations have been researched, tabled, that everybody is informed with the common goals and then they interact with a professional manner. You see that uh, cute little graphic over there, I kind of changed all the names, I kind of keep changing the names in the chairs there. <clears throat> so. Who, who that is, again, if it's a team of one, that may be a table of one, um, which means you're wearing all those hats. But in the top right, it's the customer's requirements. That's who determines if it's a class two or a class three, okay? And a class uh, one, two, or three, those are IPC specifications for <clears throat> criteria that determine whether or not something class three is life critical or class two consumer electronics, the PC you're sitting in front of, or the telephone, uh, your cell phone. Class one is that Mickey Mouse watch, okay? Completely different. Class three is life critical. That's a, you're on an airplane, you're in a medical uh, situation where it's life critical. Um, a military um, would be class three. So understanding that, working with the supply chain. If you're a supplier, you're sitting in that chair on the left somewhere. Okay, what are the testing requirements? We're gonna talk about the DF, if I say DFM or DFX, a lot of people understand that. We're gonna cover what the DFX and the DFS stand for. Um, what's our end goal is producibility, reliability, costs, okay? So <clears throat> the goal is communicating, especially with your supply chain early on in the, um, in, in the entire development cycle, okay? so. What that equates to is like this, it's the term GIGO. Perhaps you've heard of that acronym, it's garbage in equals garbage out. And if you're not capturing your data succinctly at the beginning, um, someone will just assume that the data is correct. And they're worrying about the next problem that's in front of them, the unsolved problem. If they think that the that piece is solved, they will no longer go back for it and view its accuracy and that's where the biggest dangers come in okay so <clears throat> the the term uh, drc 100 percent design rule uh, checking there are so many times that people now have a, a, a capability in their development software schematic or layout where they can say this is an acceptable error that by very definition is an oxymoron <laughs> You should not do that. The key word is moron in Oxy, and you shouldn't do that. It should truly be 100% correct by construction. So are you aware of all expectations, all the way starting from the customer's contract, the production lifestyle, life cycle, excuse me. Um, that means that uh, this board, will, what will, how many will you build in, in production yearly? How many years do you expect it to be in service? Okay, there are life cycles that exist in our, in, in our industry. And if, for example, if you're building a cell phone, everyone's got a cell phone, see I hold it up. Um, if you're building a cell phone, there's a million billion of those being developed. Cost is the biggest driver, reliability. If you're de designing something for the military or an aerospace, it's reliability, okay? Because you'll build a lower quantity, therefore the cost is not as much of a factor you cannot afford uh, unreliability. Scheduling. Scheduling, there's always a product manager um, that carries a big stick and chases after you, and they come right after engineering because they want engineering to complete it because they want to get the product to the market. And so they, they, they're always pushing to get it complete, which is their job, which is, is wonderful. That's what they should be doing. Um, and what, what occurs though is engineering by nature is a discovery science. Therefore, every day I, 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 I start working on my design, oh, I just discovered this criteria or that criteria. The schematic is still being changed while it's in layout. This is natural, it's called scope creepage. What needs to 
occur is you need to, in product project management, you need to um, record daily the impact. Because I always go in and I applaud my engineer. I said, this person is discovering uh, changes that need to occur. And essentially, we're trying to build Rev2 during the Rev1 cycle. Okay, you see the nice colored pie chart over there? That if I build a prototype, all boards are built in proto. Okay, so the first run is that. But I need to know what the end goals are. If the production build is, is, is a million billion, uh, then it, determine, it makes determinations during my development. So I will proto and try to get the circuit to work excuse me, proto build, which is a, and then I would pilot build, perhaps I should say pilot right there on the, on the second one. That is a limited run for production, you know, the NPI of things. The goal is, is that I truly can get revision one working um, and the circuit functioning. Now I truly can target it for production. Um, I've built quite a few rev ones at work. Am I boasting in that? You better believe I am because my company <laughs> loved me for it, okay? And so I should have that, um, professional pride in my workmanship. Um, it's what's going to make me stand out. So I encourage all of you to, to have that in, in your profession. Um, it, it's not ego, it's professionalism. Um, so why am I gain, uh, speaking about this development is because I want to get, you know, the engineering and mechanical and therm uh, the thermal, those are performance, solvability, and manufacturing design criteria so that when I go into manufacturing, um, we'll see what we get. Um, you'll see some of that in the next slide. So, and <clears throat> so the development timeline. So we have for so long worked with what's called the Gantt chart mentality that says, okay, um, I'm gonna allocate so much time for this phase and then for this phase. And we have predicators before we enter the next phase and we don't go to the following phase until I've completed all my deliverables. That is serial in fashion. And you wanna see why schedule slippages occur? It's um, because of that. There's a book called, uh, it talks about Scrum, which is moving together. Essentially, it comes from the, uh, the rugby type of football style, Australian football, Aussie football and where we're working together and we actually are working um, concurrently. So this shows some of the engineering development phases um, that occur, nice colorful little chart there on the left. Um, perhaps you're involved in some of those, perhaps you're down towards the green and the purple there where it's really the fabrication and assembly. The layout really should be stopping before you go into fabrication. So perhaps I'd adjust that slide, make sure that that red one stops before fabrication, because that would be very flawed if I'm thinking that I'm going to continue layout into fabrication. But I left it there because it does occur. I've actually done that in my life. I have to say that ashamedly so. I've actually given them a layer <laughs> of Gerber after they've started fabrication. And my fabricator pretty much smiled, rolled his eyes, and then said something the second the phone hung up. So um, it's just bad practice. So <clears throat> we encourage you to learn to work concurrently and use an iteration control when you do so that you understand where that person is at concurrently working by your side, okay? The <clears throat> DFS, I talked about these before, DFS, DFP, DFM. Um, this is a graphic pictorial of what became uh, IPC's chapter one, paragraph one, line one of their 2200 uh, design standards. Uh, Steph and I have serve on the IPC uh, 2200 series standards um, as uh, board members there to, to, to <clears throat> contribute to IPC. IPC is standards body. Uh, IPC is not a them, it's an us. And I encourage you to participate with the standards that we all work by. But when we made this uh, paragraph, we decided to make a graphic pictorial of it. Steph lovingly calls this the uh, designer's <laughs> triangle. And essentially what it's attempting to convey is that you cannot look at engineering layout with one perspective. You must always be looking at all three simultaneously. 
the DFS is a solvability. I mean, where that could be complex, high density, uh, HDI, you have to master your CAD tool. It's like solving a puzzle, which is thousands of pieces. Some designs that we work on have tens of thousands of views and just as many traces, nets, and parts. So it's a very dense puzzle that um, has to be perfect in, in, in its performance and its manufacturability. So the performance sliding to the lower left, that's signal integrity, EMC, EMI, power delivery, thermal, mechanical. Those are performance metrics that I don't care if you've solved it, I don't care if you build it, if it will not perform, it's a throwaway. Mm -hmm. In the same light, everything, if you cannot build it, <laughs> I don't care how well it would perform, I don't care how well it's solved, you can't build it. And so when I say build it, the DFX term uh, that actually should not be designed for excellence, it should be development for excellence because it's much broader than just designing because it includes manufacturability, testing, compliance, so many things. So it's really development. But when we say DFM, what are we saying there? When I say DFM, are you speaking the fabricator? Are you speaking the assembler? Are you speaking test compliance? Um, so the term has somewhat evolved in front of our eyes, but we all kind of get it. Um, well, what's our goal with that? Okay, we want higher yield, lower cost. And I put to you that these things inversely will react. If your yield is going down, your costs are going up. So always remember that. Because the goal of what we're shooting for with revision one working is maximum placement and routing density, optimum electrical performance, and efficient defect-free manufacturing. Mm -hmm. The designer's triangle. I, we made the ugly colors to burn it into your mind, so <laughs> sorry about that. Um, Okay, so <clears throat> metric versus inches. I can usually make people squirm when I table this subject. Um, why? Because we've all grown up learning one of the two um, uh, units of measure. Um, I would say that uh, if you're of, oh, I'm not supposed to tell dinosaur stories. If you're of my generation, okay, <laughs> um, I was in the military in 1974 and 75 in the Vietnam era. So that tells you my age. Um, I learned that about inches, and it's an imperial data system, okay? But nowadays, if you're growing up in school, um, my children and my grandchildren are learning metric. Okay, so do you value accuracy? There's the question. I really don't care what you grew up with. I'm asking the question, not what you grew up with, but do you value accuracy? Because if you do, follow along. The metric system should be used. Why? Because every part, almost every 99.9999 are metric in nature. Their dimensioning, their pitch, the spacing between pins, the pad sizes, everything about them is a metric entity. So don't use round offs. People say, oh, I can use a round off. Okay, fabrication allowances allows me to, you know, make plus or minus a half a mil or a mil. So I can use a round off. Sure you could. But the problem is you're not solving for one. You are solving for many rows and columns. Look at that BGA at the top right up there. Because you're solving for one, fine, I agree. But you're not. You're solving for many. And the problem is those tolerances will accumulate. This is literally how we crash the Beagle Rover on Mars in 19, whenever it went up there, okay? I am a Beagle owner, Snoopy, and don't be crashing Snoopy, okay? Um, where did the Imperial come from? This is, I say this for comic relief. It came from King George in about 1825. An inch was King George's thumb. So much for rules of thumb. A foot was King George's foot, okay? A, a, a yard was his stride. It's a 12 base system outside of the clock. 12 base is not fun, whereas metric is 10 base. Look at the exact dimensioning on the right. Which one would you prefer to enter into your CAD tool? The blue on the left or the ones on the right? So 
I get it, you could round off, but you apparently don't value accuracy over many entities. So that is called my metric rant. Thank you for playing along. Uh, there will be a consolation prize on the next slide. Uh, not really, okay. So when we're generating our final deliverables, let's start taking a look at this. The pick and place file going into assembly, okay? The SMT centroid data should be based on the component origin with a consistent rotation. Now there has been uh, differences and attempts to consolidate this. I remember watching Tom Hauser at PCB Libraries write up a, uh, a piece showing all the different, um, what they call zero base origins because zero base origins is what a tape and reel goes off of. It's what a pick and place machine goes off of, but it's also the data I produce in my pick and place file. If I don't give that consistently across the board, someone has got a programming nightmare. Nightmare. Okay. Um, so you should output the unit of measure that design was completed. Ideally, that should be metric. Okay, I already said that. Um, you should reference the uh, bareboard datum, preferably a non-plated tooling hole in the lower left corner inside the board outline, okay? You'll have a greater degree of accuracy. Um, a drilled hole happens early on in the fabrication process, and because it's non-plated, it's more accurate, it doesn't have plating in the hole, okay? Now, fiducials are another form of tooling. You see that in the lower left there. Um, fiducials should provide a, an extra calibration methodology for the handling um, of a uh, placement of parts. It's an optical uh, calibration, as I mentioned before. Typically, you should have a clearance from the solder mask so it doesn't uh, incorrectly register. It should be consistent. Now, the different types of fiducials. You have general three board fiducials, you can triangulate on the board. You can put them on the panel, um, and you can also um, put them on fine pitch parts although machines are getting better, the need for that is diminishing. But you also can put what's known as an X-out fiducial, which um, is on each entity on a panel, and that essentially communicates that if one of the boards did not pass a drill or uh, some sort of netless testing, that the fabricator can block that out, and then you therefore would uh, automatically uh, calibrate your pick-and-place machine. So the libraries, as you've seen on the right, that image comes from PCB libraries. Again, a shout out to them. A 3D shows um, some visuals, can do some 3D checking. Um, the, the pink outline shows a placement courtyard. What needs to be understood with the placement courtyard is the height attribute, because this helps the assembler uh, truly get um, heat in and under parts and gives a better manufacturability. Um, so. And the land patterns, uh, the pin terminals, it's not a footprint. A footprint is what you make when you press the part into clay. It's a land pattern where a solder joint is formed. And the solder joint, um, IPC has a specification, 7351, I think that's the number, um, that um, whereby a solder joint is a mathematical equation to get a robust solder joint. Okay. So when we start considering some of our manufacturing data for bare and assembled boards, understanding the terms and the definition helps. If I say assembly panel, that quickly, everyone's mind did two things. The fabricator says, okay, you're talking about my panel. The, most people think the, when I say the word panel, they're talking about the assembly array. <laughs> okay, these two terms are often used inappropriately and can cause for a miscommunication, which can result in a potential cost adder, okay? Does it seem like I'm splitting hairs there? I mean, I'm not gonna correct the world's understanding of the usage of this, but I will, whenever I can, teach the correct words to it. The fabricator makes a panel, okay? He builds a panel, purely. He does not build a single board. They build a panel, okay? They have one large board on it, or could have several individual boards on it, that can also contain one or several assembly arrays. An assembly array. This term should be reserved for the manufacturing process of assembly where the components are soldered onto the board. An array can have one or several individual boards, uh, typically with a manufacturing handling rail for the conveyors and the ovens, whereby we maintain our accuracy, tooling, and various things like that. So again, the handling rail can be on the individual board, and or it can be on an array of multiple upboards. Uh, but the single board without a handling array is 
tough, heavy assembler will tell you that. <clears throat> now, the bottom note here, this is something that um, is, is, is important. These objectives can compete because the assembler wishes to populate more boards on one array, but the fabricator wants panel yield, truly wants to get as many boards on the panel. And there are times when I can put three boards up on an array where I now only get, say, maybe a 50% yield from my bare board panel. And that just doubled the cost, or in, in this case, that would um, add a 33% adder. So the optimum goal, or, or the goal is to optimize both perspectives to get the maximum yield for the bare board panel, because it starts there. And that's probably more of a cost adder in the overall push and shove of it. But the assembler, again, wants to say, if I put three boards into my oven versus two, that's a 33% cost adder there. So um, just be aware that those two exist. And oftentimes, uh, they're different manufacturers, OK? Now, oftentimes, the assembler will contract out the bare board, um, and they just buy them. They're not worried about the cost because they didn't incur the cost. They didn't, in, you know, they didn't charge that cost. They just said this is what it costs. But when they coordinate together, we can minimize both. So this shows you an example of that. A picture tells a thousand words. So you see uh, in black on the left the fabricator's panel with the tooling, the coupons, and what's called the working area out there. And then there's a separation between. Um, what would be the entities in the fabrication panel. What is in that fabrication panel is an assembly array. There are eight boards in eight arrays. So I kind of showed it to you, two-tone there in a breakout. But you see the handling array, array or excuse me, the handling rails in the array. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that is an optimum uh, yield. Typically, it's one inch working area around the outside. And there's a handful of free software tools that can do that and, and or work with your fabricator to gain the, uh, the optimum yield. So the excise methods, um, excising, let me jump back real quick. That's when you break out one single board, you're going to do so. <clears throat> There's many different ways in which this um, can be designed and occur. Uh, it's created the fabrication stage. Um, so it's a method to remove a single board. It could be done by the assembler or by the end customer um, prior to final assembly uh, or after final, or if you're building into an enclosure or a box. So uh, when that occurs, uh, it's subjective. But there's several methods or combinations that could be used to do that. This is something typically the designer is putting into the fabrication drawing and into the database. They design one image, but then they, they uh, communicate a step and repeat into the array. But the methods are shearing or blanking. That's probably one of the most cost effective. It's a machine and just boom, it punches it right out. The dual V score, um, can, it can be easy to excise. Um, it can leave a little bit of a stub and it can have a slight moisture absorption edge. When it's routed, um, essentially there's, it's a very, it's the cleanest edge you can get. And actually, it's like using a drill. It actually will heat the edge. And when you heat it, the uh, materials have a resin content whereby it seals it a little bit. And again, it's a very clean edge. So it's the best, but that's time consuming. The scoring or the routing, um, they're two of the most common methods used for excising assembly. But it, a lot of times it depends on the, qu the quantity, the count. Uh, per year or per, per lifetime. Uh, but when you use some of them, there's a small connection bridge that is left. And, um, you know, they, that is oftentimes referred to as a mouse bite or rat bite. These are additional holes that are in that breakaway area. Oftentimes they're recessed. They're pulled back a little bit to stop that rough edge from sticking outside the board parameter and might affect the, you know, it's fit with the housing. The danger is then if, if the fabricator is putting them in, um, hopefully the designer has cleared away the copper. So you do not want to expose metal on there. Uh, that would make for bad data. 
okay? So there's no one best method for this, okay? But collaboration with the end production needs should be sought early in the design. And, you know, we understand these things early on. Don't solve these issues late in the design cycle. Oh, I'm doing my fab drawing because the design is complete. No, your fab drawing, these issues should have been solved day one of your mm -hmm. layout development. So when we create our bare boards, um, we will talk about the end data in a minute. Um, we create our Gerbers or whatever it is we create and we do an, a multi-up, okay? The stencil or uh, stencil is used for surface mount parts whereby we're putting a paste, um, a, 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 a paste of solder on the surface mount land for the reflow oven and we generate a stencil artwork whereby stencils are created and they are either you know the, the, the mesh metal um, and or nowadays there's some, some direct deposit um, better for prototype runs or limited quantity runs. The stencils are a little bit more geared towards production, um, but I know there's a lot of assemblers on here that could probably answer that better than I could, um, but that's a rough discussion of that. The stencils, we as a designer are creating a one-up image, but then we're telling somebody to make a multi-up. Now here's what occurs is if I go to my fabricator, our my fabricator understands um, what's called manufacturing process allowances. When I output CAD data, it is true position data. I mean, it is down to the decimal point. Bup, 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 bup. It's as accurate as can be, but the fabricator and the assembler cannot do that because they have manufacturing process allowance, allowances whereby the laws of physics come in and material moves and or uh, tolerances accumulate between uh, various features or processes during the manufacturing. They understand them, they make uh, uh, calibration effects to the data. And I put to you that the stencil should reflect that. I request that my fabricator, when they stretch my Gerber to make it come as one-to-one -one as they can, that they generate the multi-up stencil. If I send it to a stencil house and ask them to do it, they have not made the stencil adjustments that match the Gerber adjustments my fabricator did. So thus my manufacturing process allowances would not be in sync. So you're literally, by doing that practice, you're making a discontinuity of accuracy. So um, encourage the fabricator to produce the, the production masters. So, okay, so moving right along here, the um, final deliverables. Um, that is a term to uh, those in the development phase that we respect that term because all engineering stops when I push the button. <laughs> engineering is done, okay? Um, and so from a design perspective, we're out to produce the bare board first, and then we're gonna take the bare board plus the parts to an assembler and ask them to apply the third entity solder and join them together. But to us, the bare board has a little bit more significance because that's the, that's the landing pad for it all and therefore its accuracy to us is of a higher um, uh, caliber. So that's not to diminish the other one. To us, it's a controlled document. The fabrication or master drawing as it's oftentimes termed by IPC um, with all of its files is one entity. And it should contain a, a handful of things as shown here. Um, the most important thing on here is indeed the notes. And there's drilling instruction details. There's a stack up there, but I put you that stack up as a reference stack up. The fabricator um, supplied early in the design phase, emphasis on early, a production stack up. That is accurate. This is reference. And all the call outs from the surface finish to the material, to the marking, to the test requirements, to the impedance controls, and any copper balancing known as thieving or anything like that um, should be very much controlled entities. You're designing this thing in accordance to an IPC specification at a class specification. Uh, I don't know if you can see them up there, the 41. 01, 4101, the IPC 6012. Um, there's several other that are in there. 
um, from the solder mask, etc. And these are controlled entities. Contro class two is a legal stipulation. And saying class two or class three is not just something I put on a fab drawing because that affects the design process, which is a contractual agreement based on that specification. But the point I'm making is that the designer, the design engineer, that board must be designed to the class two or class three requirements. It's not just a manufacturing stipulation, it's a design stipulation. You cannot build a class three board with a class two design feature. Repeat, you cannot build a class three board with a class two feature. You lose it in a lawsuit. I've literally been a subject matter expert on a multi-million dollar lawsuit. The design lost because you must do both, okay? And they'll go after the, the assembler first because that's the last person. Then they'll go back to the fabricator and then it goes back to the origin point, which was the design. So I'm just telling you how it played out. Um, so on the right, you have two forms whereby we and the design can output our data, non-intelligent data. And that typically I say non-intelligent because Gerber, um, we, we try to use a, uh, one of those accents and kind of say, I dumb data, you know, I'm using my best um, hillbilly accent right there, trying to uh, mock it a little bit. So forgive me if that's incorrect. But it's not, it's not intelligent. It's numerical controlled. That's the only intelligence it has. We can attempt to give it intelligence by providing a, an IPC 356 netlist. It is a limited form. And if you are not doing that, um, you are making bad data. Mm -hmm. Always produce that. Um, you are producing an NC route profile which is the only dimensions that are really required. And you see all the dimensions on that left-hand side? Those are all reference. The real reference is the overall, which shows you how to panelize it um, for assembly and fabrication. The actual feature outlines, they're not necessary because they're all inside of that route profile, okay? The drill data. I don't need to stipulate where any holes are on my fab drawing because they're in the NC drill data. Okay, the stencil data, again, should be panelized up by the fabricator. And then if you have any workmanship instructions, that is in either these notes or in communication agreement notes with the fabricator. Now, intelligent data, the ODB++, which uh, started with uh, Valor, uh, Mentor Graphics bought that at some point, IPC, um, trying to create more of a neutral uh, uh, CAD neutral, if you would, version of that came up with the IPC 2581. Most all CAD tools can output these, I believe, and they are an intelligent data. Now, many people are, are concerned, and you should be, about outputting all of your intellectual property in the ODB or 2581 output because you don't want to send schematic and circuit information uh, overseas. It, you can't do it if you're DOD or ITAR the international trade and arms restriction, you can't do that. But you can scale back the output of your ODB++, your intelligent data, to not do that. The ODB++, a production assembly house can actually, or a fabricator can incorporate what manufacturing process allowances were put into your final data into this. So therefore, you're maintaining um, the process allowances for subsequent production runs. So learn how to use that. Ask your fabricator if they can uh, work with um, these. And whenever you can, um, it removes some of the guesswork um, by providing more intelligent data, but control it. Um, Steph had me add this one little note up there that it can cost up to six grand to fix one typo when you work for a big company. Big companies spend a lot of time worrying about accuracy, um, version control, and things like that. And so they exercise that control with change control boards, um, ECOs, ECRs. And so uh, he says that just to warn you that correct by construction is exactly what you should do. Thorough design reviews. Um, I, I mentioned earlier that I would share a live example of that. My friend, Steph, I've um, known him for decades now. 
He's a U.S. Marine, and he shows that in his workmanship. He stayed up two nights ago all night long <laughs> doing what I term the CAD miracle. He's hanging his head right now. I know he is. <laughs> and, and it was his determination to get a job out on time, but th to make it accurate. He wouldn't let go until it was accurate because he values that integrity for his company's products. Um, that is the time of, type of dedication oftentimes that engineering professionals will try to put into this. And um, uh, I don't know if the board shipped yet, Steph, so I'm just um, I'm giving you that side <laughs> eyebrow right now. And, and I appreciate your attention to detail. Um, so let me, moving along here, the assembly drawing and data. To the design person, we call this a reference document, okay? Now, that's not to diminish its value or what it's doing, but the control document, as I used the term on the previous slide, the fabrication drawing is the control document for the bare board. When it comes to the assembled board, the control document is the bill of material. The bill of material is indeed the control document. The assembly drawing is a line item. So therefore it appears, it's there, but it's reference. Can you read anything on there? I made it fuzzy so you couldn't. <laughs> um, <laughs> it, it, you don't need to. You don't need to know anything on those imagery is already in the um, data files, okay, which are supplied data. Okay, they are located in the bill of material. There are some workmanship um, notes that go into here, so therefore it's a valued document. I'm not trying to diminish it. There are assembly steps that could be in here, but it is more of a reference document with some workmanship and or process steps that might be indicated in those notes. The notes are the intelligent part of this drawing. Um, other than that, it's a, it's a very valuable reference. And nowadays, um, Steph and I just talked about this on this very large board he's working on, is so many components on this board, I don't want to brag about the numbers, but we couldn't put all the, I said we, did you see that stuff? We couldn't put <laughs> all the reference designators on the board. So we pulled them off. Steph and I discussed this. We pulled off the capacitors, the resistors, and just show the primary ones. And then what was our end statement? Let's provide a searchable PDF. That is what's going to facilitate mm -hmm. uh, the legibility of seeing the location. Um, and or a pick and place file, which truly communicates to the machine. So you can see what's on there, the pick and place file, the stencil, marking instructions, workmanship, handling, uh, parts kit. So that's essentially the assembly data. All data, fabrication and assembly should be coalesced into a tar or a zip file and called fab.zip or assembly.zip. I do not send assembly data to the fabricator. I may send both of them to the assembler if they're contract building the fab, they need both. Um, I never send my archived database. I'll discuss that later, but I'm just gonna give it twice because it's super important, intellectual mm -hmm. property. So when you're outputting your data, this is very much a tightly controlled, accurate event. You wanna produce exactly what the manufacturer needs, not what you think they need, what they say they need. And you know that and you make sure it's it's all the file names are have some human intelligence. Don't just go layer one dot Gerber because you'll do a million boards and you don't want them all called that. You'd say part number revision L1 dot Gerber. Wow, I know exactly what that is. I don't have to open it up. It tells me right there by its file name. The file type tells you what type of file it is. So. Again, we talked about the non-intelligent um, data. Uh, so again, that's a repeat, I won't go into that. But um, when you produce these, when you submit it, the engineering cycle ends, okay? And the, fair, or the design person should support the manufacturing engineers and process people. You're gonna have gone early and collaborated with them so that they understand what you're gonna give them. You give them a DFM database week before you're done and ready to build so they can catch any last minute things. And then after you start it, you should not have to start stop with a fabricator or an assembler. You've worked those things out, but you are on call to support them while it's in manufacturing. You should be. So the file naming convention, I already said this, it should have human intelligence. Okay, yeah, part number, revision, a qualifier, and type. 
okay? And then when you zip and compress them, they should have these acronyms so you know exactly what the zip file is, who it's for, what's the appropriate destination. And the manufacturing support, it's a continued interface and support, okay? Um, any delays are extremely costly and cause unwanted schedule delays. And keep in mind that the delays on a manufacturing floor, they've got another customer that's ready to jump on their line. And so if your data is wrong and they put you on hold, you're thinking that they're going to sit idle. That's just pouring money out the back door for a manufacturer. They don't and won't do it. Okay. They'll mm -hmm. queue you up and they'll try to tell you that we're jumping right on it. But the reality is they've got a queue of work. They have to. They have a, a, a tight profit window and therefore they must maintain their lines in uh, optimum working condition. So. Now, the last bullet here, archives. Once the final deliverables have been created and accepted by your supply chain, uh, there should be no further activity on that database. It should be archived and never opened again. It should be archived and never opened again. Any further changes you want to do or any modifications, they're going to occur on a copy of that database, and it should be termed revision next whatever you want to call it. Typically, they're numerical in engineering and they're alpha in production. That's the norm. But uh, never open it again. The cement has dried. So last slide here. Um, the ultimate goal is to ensure that design data is correct by construction. It'll be manufactured with high producibility, high yield, low cost, high reliability. High producibility. This is an IPC description, okay? It's considered for all aspects and features of our board. If you need a small, or, or excuse me, a, a very small high aspect ratio via in one area of the board, don't think that that's a green light to put it all over your board. Just put it where you need it. Go larger, make it more robust. Keyword, robust. Because then your producibility has been reduced by a significant factor, you've increased that. If I have uh, a low uh, producible via, my traces could be high producible. So there, it can be segmented in what is producible, okay? Because here's what happens is the high yield, low cost, inversely low yield, high cost. Um, an example of that might be a 5% impedance, someone wants that. And guess what, it really can't be achieved. Okay, readily anyway. Um, it a, has a low producibility because the laws of physics and etch loss really stop that from occurring. So how does a fabricator do that? Well, guess what? It was a low yield. I have to build an extra panel. Therefore, your cost just went up. I'll tell you, yes, I can build it. Okay, but I can't push the magic dust on it. Okay, they know how to tightly control and take it up a little bit. But trust me, they're already doing as much as they can. Sometimes it means basically a lower yield, okay? So the high reliability, okay? This is the end game. You're in business not to produce one part. You're in business to have a part that stays in the field for 20 years. I know what Steph produces when he designs some. They go up in an airplane and they're up there for 20 to 40 years, okay? So reliability is the name of the game there. and the thermal excursion is not just during the manufacturing of it, fabrication, assembly. It's not just the heating of the parts in use. It's the environment it goes into, and then it's therefore the sum of all of that over the lifetime. And the danger is, is that yeah. failures, typically in a product, are intermittent. They only show up during extreme thermal expansion. And therefore, and debug where a via breaks when you've got 100,000 amount of panel on 24 layers. Good grief, it's like a needle in a haystack. So design robust producibility, you'll get high yield, low cost, and therefore your products is reliable. So with that, <laughs> that's our last slide, and um, we would like to turn it open for questions. Really appreciate everyone listening along. And so um, Jacqueline, at this point, um, as any questions come forward. 
Okay, yeah, you've got quite a bit of questions, but the first, thank you guys. That was an awesome presentation. We really appreciate it. Um, to all of you listening, if there are any questions that you have for either of the gentlemen, please feel free to submit them at this time, but I'm gonna start off with the first question. And let me know if you want me to repeat any of these too. Uh, what is the most common panel size domestic and Asian fabricators use? Okay, um, Steph, if I may, I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump on most of these and I'll defer to you if I need to. Sure. I work, okay. I work for a, um, a distributor, Inselectro is North, North America sole distributor for Isola and DuPont products. Um, so that is what our company does. We supply them to the fabricators you build with. And the material typically comes in 24 by 48 uh, sheets of material. They are pre-preg and core, which metal on both sides. One is cured hard, and the other one is soft flexible. They alternately construct those. They are cut typically um, by us, the distributor. Some fabricators cut their own, and they are then put into an 18 by 24. This is an international standard. Um, standard, there are exceptions to that, so I'm not gonna talk about the exceptions, but 18 by 24 is the short answer. Um, but it depends on the equipment your fabrication line has, because that 18 by 24 can then be subdivided into a half panel or a quarter panel. Why, if I truly have a teeny tiny little board, why would I want to put it on a big part? It would not be optimum yield. So they come in 18 by 24s and then half and then quarter. Okay, the next question is, is scoring cheaper than mouse bites? Uh, that's a subjective question with a subjective answer, okay? Um, it would depend on a company's ability to do that. The person that really is gonna answer that is your fabricator. I could give you my opinion, but I'm not gonna fabricate one board for you. So therefore, I'm gonna defer that answer to your specific fabricator. What, what might be cheaper than to one company is more expensive to another. So questions of that nature, which is a wonderful question, truly is something you need to have in a communication relationship with your fabricator and assembler, okay? And it can be dependent truly on the production of how many boards are in your production run. So it may be cheaper to, you know, mouse bite one or V-score another, but uh, the speed and accuracy may be a better choice. So cost is not the only driver, um, production quantity, um, production equipment and um, handlers, who does it? So a very subjective question with a very subjective answer. Thanks for asking it. The next question is, how much of the information presented is covered in IPC 2231? 2231, I'm gonna say 2221, okay, is, is where I'm gonna steer you towards the, just the, I'm gonna call it the 2200 series um, is the design set of standards. Um, IPC has a design standards tree, which I'd encourage you to get. It shows you all the different types of standards for fabrication, for assembly, for test, for compliance, for workmanship, for producibility, for materials, um, for design, the 2200 is design. And I would say it's all there somewhere. So when Steph and I teach the IPC standards, we tell them, I never expect you to understand where it is where everything is within the standards. What I expect you to understand is this, control F. Open your PDF, your company has paid for these standards, have access to them and open them, control F. Boom, hit class three and scroll through all 31 entries. I, it's about that number. Um, where class three occurs, learn. So uh, that's a vague answer, but I'm encouraging you to not eat the fish I hand you, I'm teaching you to learn how to fish. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, the next question is, I do always insist on four decimal MM throughout the process. Is this acceptable? Um, I think it's a good practice um, to do that at a bare minimum. Your Gerber's, um, uh, the 274, um, don't use D, use X, um, and then you, typically will stipulate in your workmanship notes um, how many de uh, de decimal points you are using. Um, keep in mind that machines have the ability to calibrate to the, oftentimes the nth degree, okay? So you can, 
but the laws of physics say that manufacturing process allowances actually work in the plus or minus of, you know, one mil or less, or, you know, the uh, <clears throat> 0.025 or, you know, so it, it's really pretty small, the, the accuracy. So much of that is lost in the round off. What you want to be careful is not to design to round offs because that's how the errors will accumulate. Okay, so I encourage you, for example, if you're in the DOD world and they want you to design in metric, uh, uh, or excuse me, in inch base, you know, I, I excuse me, let me re let's start again. I encourage you to design in metric because every part is metric. And therefore, to route a metric line between metric parts, the round offs are easy. Point one. You want to do it accurately, 0 0.03964287 five. <laughs> Don't do that. It's a metric part on a metric board, design in metric, and then comply to your company's wishes, output in inches. Let the mm -hmm. system handle all the round offs. Let the system output to the nth degree. Your fabricator and assembler can work with whatever you got. They've got expensive equipment. Mm -hmm. All right, the next question is, shouldn't you include some whole dimensions on the fab drawing for the benefit of first article inspection? Okay, wonderful question, wonderful question. And, and that's a very good practice. I would take the, what we teach in the CID, CID Plus, is that you stipulate um, uh, three mutually exclusive perpendicular datum planes. The primary, which is the secondary side of the board, it's flat drop a book on a table, it's flat in the Z axis, okay? And secondarily is on the left side, which gives you a certain amount of perpendicularity. And then a third, a tertiary datum that establishes um, no movement. You don't need that third hole or third datum plane, okay? Because you've already established that with the primary datum of it being Z axis flat. Your purpose for quality inspection is to establish X, Y, and Z so that perpendicularity and a Cartesian plane is respected. So very good question. And I always recommend that you indicate minimum of three holes to establish that. Um, I like that. Typically you have mounting holes on your board. And if you don't, if you can add a non-plated tooling hole, you should do that. But that is what you should dimension. All she really need to do is establish to produce the board is to put the zero zero datum, which the CAD com the CAD software had you established to design the board. But to communicate that for incoming inspection, um, the more details you can provide, the better. Um, so I agree with that perspective. Um, I encourage you to output and use datum style dimensioning on your fab drawing. And if you want to use reference incremental style dimensioning for incoming inspection, that would be helpful to them. But your fabricator and your assembler will use datum style dimensioning because they deal with NC, numerical controlled data. So your goal is to produce the board, not just inspect it. You want to do both, but you first must produce it. So um, cover both perspectives. Very good question. Very good. These are all good. Keep going. Mm -hmm. All right, the next question, if the designer creates the stencil data, how is the stencil data validated to ensure it is correct for a new board design? Is the stencil data developed based on IPC stencil design guidelines? Well, it's, it's developed by the CAD designer is going to produce the one up. And what I suggested is that if the, whoever designs the multi-up array, okay, the fabricator will take the Gerber and will step and repeat it in a CAM operation, and they will provide manufacturing process allowances where they understand material movement, material stretching, okay, and all these different factors. And they essentially are stretching it, knowing that once it contracts and comes back, that they will have calibrated it to truly be as you wanted it, accurate one to one. And therefore, having the stencil. Gerber files created by that same fabricator takes whatever manufacturing process allowances and puts it into the multi-up stencil. It is then given to a stencil house to make either a 
truly a mesh stencil or however methodology they do, or it might go into a direct deposit, kind of like a uh, inkjet printer, if you would, uh, where it's rasterized. And so that's essentially how it's done. The IPC guideline for um, uh, stencil uh, land pattern feature sizes is one to one. We encourage you to make them one to one with the exception on large thermal pads, okay? Large thermal pads, the IPC um, 7351 and many of the calculators that are existing today. I, I know I mentioned the PCB libraries is one that's uh, started most of this image, so they deserve the honorable mention. Um, utilizes what's known as a 50% um, ratio of solder paste to exposed metal pad. And that's for the large pads, because you don't want so much paste on that center pad that it would act as a teeter-totter and uh, mm. affect the cold planarity once the solder wets. So very good question. One-to-one -one is your answer, though. That's the quick answer. All right, the next question is, what whole aspect ratio does the supplier consider a higher cost? What is the ideal ratio to achieve? Okay, that, that again is a wonderful question because you were mm -hmm. asking a question of producibility, okay? <clears throat> and I'm going to answer in a similar manner that I answered a previous question, is that actually is dependent on your supply chain. There are different fabricators um, and assemblers across the, uh, the market, the industry, that deal with different segments of, of the industry, that handle the difficult producibility boards. And they charge more money for it. And they've made it their mission. If your goal is to do low, lower volume, lower producibility, you're geared towards that. Okay? And there's mid-level. Um, so there are many that are high quality and handle these difficult producibilities. Their capabilities to handle a high aspect ratio via. Okay? And why this question is so important is because it's the primary failure point on a circuit board, okay, that's gonna occur based on the design data and then how it's fabricated. What is challenged is the ability to plate that hole consistently. A class two versus a class three has thicker whole wall plating requirements. And therefore its reliability is increased with a class three. And it also is not just the whole um, which is the board thickness to the drill width ratio. It is also the annular ring affects plating also. Mm -hmm. So those two factors are design factors that affect the producibility. And um, so the general answer should not be used. I'll give it to you. <laughs> 10 to one is, is probably right in that ratio. And IPC in the 2222 gives you a chart on that. So go look it up. Okay, and they tell you about what are general standard things, but don't go with a general standard. That's a rule of thumb. And unless you're King George, don't be using a rule of thumb. Ask your specific supply chain what is appropriate, and you do so by suggesting the required drill size at day one of your CAD design. And they'll tell you, uh uh uh, uh don't be building that, <laughs> don't be doing yeah. it, you can't do it. <laughs> they'll tell you. They're eager to tell you because they want to bill you a reliable product. So great question. Next. The next question is, does ODB++ include all data in the fab drawing? Um, again, good question. We did cover that in one of those slides in the back end. It'll, it'll contain exactly what you tell it. Okay. Um, uh, Steph, I don't know, you probably produce more ODB++ in your lifetime, but it is scalable into what you output. Okay, you give me an amen on that one, Steph. What do you think? Yes, most definitely. Uh, it, you can give the whole kitchen sink if you're not aware of what you're producing, as you said earlier in your slide. Uh, you can give your, your entire uh, IP. Uh, so you got to be very mindful when you're generating that ODB plus plus or 2581 you know, intelligent data of what you're configuring and what you're handing off. So it it it, it has a lot of information, and that's why it's intelligent data. Your product can be easily uh, re-engineered, uh, depending on what you give them. Therefore, to learn the best way to do that, um, talk to a colleague within your company, uh, talk to your tool provider, or um, uh, come join the PCEA. Yes, I was just going to say. 
come collaborate with people who are doing the same function you're doing. Um, so there's designers, engineers, fabricators, and assembler in our organization. And our goal is that when we produce that bare board and engineer it, that the SMTA has got a bunch of successful people. So that's why we're collaborating here together. See the slide in front yeah. of you. Um, so let yeah. me plug there. Next question, please. Yeah. It looks like this is the last question that we have. And the question is, are assembly drawings typically part of PCB design data or produced in AutoCAD type applications? Okay, wonderful uh, question. So okay. wonderful question. It is capable to produce them in either. Okay, and you used AutoCAD product plug. Uh, I would say uh, Blueprints is another, uh, SolidWorks. There's, there is a bunch of uh, what I call mm, second party, that was as an upgrade from third party, software tools that are out there. My recommendation is if you are actually sending it out to that other tool, you should control it very much. Uh, it should be a very controlled event. Um, there's plus and minuses to it. You have advanced features where you can actually do some of the manufacturing process allowances, like perhaps some of the stencil uh, calibration or making the assembly array. So if you're doing that, if it's just because you've got a mechanical uh, designer or engineer that wants to own that output, um, I put to you that now your data output is in two CAD software tools, computer-aided mm -hmm. designs tools. Uh, I don't like that, personally speaking, but it's a personal preference I'm stating there. Mm -hmm. um, I like to generate it from my, um, my eCAD software tool. That's my preference. Um, but I'd highly recommend you secure one of these second party tools um, if you want the value added features that they provide. So that's a subjective answer to a subjective question. I mean, Steph, do you use a third party? Yeah. So I, I would tell you, it depends, uh, from my perspective, it depends on, on what your company, how, what your structure is. For example, uh, in my division within Collins Aerospace, we have a, a full MCAD team. So our, our two digital thread are, are, are interchanging between MCAD and ECAD. We use NX, and NX is another uh, mechanical tool, and our handshakes uh, back and forth. ECAD produces the, all the fabrication data, but when it comes to assembly, um, assembly uh, the assembly drawing will be created in NX. And uh, from, from information that we see back as a, as a uh, bidirectional handshake as part of the digital thread uh, of the board design, so the drawing will ultimately, the assembly drawing will be produced in, in the NX mechanical tool because our ECAD tools, as good as they are, they are not good drawing tools. We, we can design boards phenomenally, very complex, but the, the true drawing uh, tools, will, uh, and you mentioned uh, Blueprint. Blueprint is an excellent uh, tool, plug to them. Uh, but you have uh, SolidWorks, NX, but these are true mechanical tools. and. And it just depends on your company structure and who's doing what. And uh, uh, as Mike said, I, I would prefer to control it in one, one tool, uh, whether uh, it's Expedition, LTM, uh, uh, Cadence, uh, ORCAD, uh, or uh, whatever your team's uh, structure is. So it can be done either, either way. Thanks for providing that second perspective on that, Steph. So there's, there's truly two answers, and it's dependent on your company and uh, your goals. So thank you very much for asking all the questions you have today. Uh, great group. Um, do come and join our uh, PCE-A.org um, yep, yep. and hope to see you at our next SMTA seminar. Yes, thank yes. You. Very exciting. Also, thank July 14th, uh, Tuesday, yeah. our grand opening. Check us out. Back to you, Jacqueline. Well, Mike and Steph, thank you so much for sharing your extensive knowledge with us today. Uh, we received an abundance of positive comments in the questions field. And one person in particular said they really enjoyed the bigger picture view that you provided them with. So um, we really appreciate your time today. Awesome. And to all of you listening, um, we do welcome any further attendee comments, suggestions, or input that you have. So a short survey will be sent out to you after this webinar concludes. So please, please take a few minutes to complete it as it's valuable to both SMTA and the two speakers here today. Um, before we conclude, just want to remind you that um, they will be, well, Mike will be presenting another webinar on Thursday, August 20th, as well as they will both be participating in SMTA I um, this year. So be sure to check out our website for any additional details and thank you to all of you and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day and that we see you at the next SMTA event.
Thanks, guys. Have a great day. Thanks. You too. Bye, guys. Thanks. Right. Bye-bye. Thank you, Jacqueline. Thank you.